All right, so I'm ready whenever you are. Uh, we ready to get going? Come on, Christian. Come on, dude. <laughs> um, cool. Awesome. Yeah, you want to do your own intro? Sure. All right. <laughs> Hello. My name is Sam Gillespie. I work for Comcast, the cable company, and I think it's pretty awesome that Verizon provided this space. So thanks, Verizon, because this place is pretty awesome. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is actually a lot of what questions were being fielded is, how do I configure reliably? How do I guarantee a bootstrap of when I configure my JK instance today, if I bootstrap it next year, how do I guarantee that it'll bootstrap the same way and still work? Because uh, a lot of typical mannerisms that people use with uh, config management aren't very item potent or even uh, repeatable. Because simply you just don't understand the Jenkins infrastructure like someone like me who's been with the project for five years, give or take. Um, so this, this is for me to sort of bring you, if you're a beginner or intermediate user of Jenkins, up to being advanced. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of the script console. You may be sad or happy, depending on your personality, that I don't use slides. Uh, this is going to be all interactive. You may also have a similar opinion that I don't have a Q&A section. Uh, ask questions as I go. Uh, I don't, I'm not averse to fielding questions as we roll, and we'll take it wherever your interests go. Um, so I'll give a quick introduction to Jenkins infrastructure. Um, so as our Tyler had mentioned, there is an artifactory. Uh, this artifactory instance, believe it or not, Jenkins publishes every version of the war file, every version of the plugin to this artifactory instance. And if you want to guarantee quality for your on-site enterprise installation, you can roll your own on-site Maven repository, whatever it may be. And I'm sure that if you look up Maven repositories on-site, you'll find a few, uh, including Artifactory, that you can actually proxy Jenkins CI's Artifactory and go ahead and QA your own plugin updates and QA and pass whatever revisions you want from that Artifactory instance and they'll always be available for you on site. Not only that, you could wrap your own HTTPS into it uh, so that you have uh, on encryption for your on site instance as well as uh, the Jenkins CI instance offers an HTTPS endpoint so you can download them. And then you, it's left to the reliability of Maven or my personal favorite, Gradle to download the exact versions of every of your version of Jenkins plus every version of plugin you decide to use for your installation. Um, that also has the friendly side effect of being able to guarantee a bootstrap on a developer's laptop and in production and have it behave the same way, uh, which I also find it being very handy. So if you're interested in that, you can look more into that. Uh, you can also reach out to me. I'm going to skip how to contact me because I'm in this meetup, so you know how to contact me. Um, and we're just going to start digging right in. So this is a fresh Jenkins installation. This Jenkins installation has a few extra plugins installed, but the gist of it is I ran java minus jar jenkins.war, got a local host 8080, I installed a few plugins such as the git plugin, the github oauth plugin, and in addition to that I also upgraded all plugins to their latest revisions just because I could. Um, so this, to, to the most advanced, dangerous, awesome interface in Jenkins is the script console. Jenkins embeds Groovy. Groovy allows you to do crazy things. Uh, for instance, Groovy allows you to access private methods of Java classes. You can do that. It's just how Groovy works. Uh, incidentally, you can do that in the script console as well because it's Groovy. Um, so let's get started on how to get an introduction to this. And if you're not quite using Jenkins yet and are worried that you won't understand the content here, don't worry. We're recording it. I am recording it. It'll be published later. And once you get familiar with Jenkins, you can come back, watch it, and get more familiar as you go. Um, so let's start. The first example that the script console offers you is 
how to look up what plugins you have on your instance. Now, the script console is more for like the hacker curious type. Uh, basically, you just have, a, have to have a little bit of curiosity and just explore a little. So let's go ahead and just run this simple line. And here it shows a list of all your plugins. Um, one of the first things that I did, because, go ahead. Yeah, I can try. Let me see. How is that? So one of the things that I typically do when I first get into an interactive interface is, how do I list the methods on a class? So the first thing I Googled was, Groovy, how do I list methods on a class? And it gave me the answer. I'm not going to Google it here because I already know it, but feel free to Google it yourselves because it took me a long time to memorize it, and it's pretty ugly, but it works. Uh, and the next thing I did was I started you know, chopping off bits of this to see how far I can go, and I, and I eventually got to instance. Uh, instance is, is the Jenkins instance itself. Now, I'm going to mention a quick statement, and we'll revisit this often. And it's a very, very, very powerful statement for understanding the script console. And here it is. The Jenkins runtime is itself its configuration. Any modification you make to the runtime is a modification you make to the XML that eventually gets serialized to disk. That is a very, very, very powerful thing if you're into automatic configuration. Item potent configuration, that is changing things by checking state first, but only change it under certain conditions. And it provides pretty much an interface to touch anything and everything. You can break the security, you could download credentials plain text, you can put a picture of Chuck Norris on the front if you want. You can do anything in this. You can modify the runtime, and that is very powerful. And we're going to do that here, and, and I'm going to prove it. I'm not just going to say it, we're going to do it. Um, I am also the maintainer of the GitHub OAuth plugin. So if you want to see an example of this later, I actually am the type of person who is very adamant about thorough documentation. And the plugin I maintain is fairly well documented, including examples of how to configure it on the script console. Um, so let's, let's, before we begin on showing you more about that, Let's start with what we've got. Let's list some methods on this. And you'll be, if you're familiar with Jenkins, you'll begin to recognize some keywords. So, and ignore the crypticness. Like I said, you can look it up later. So, this is how Groovy lists methods on a class. And what methods I listed was not by looking at the source code, but actually listing the methods on the runtime itself, the instance. And here's a couple that you might start recognizing. Um, a couple that I'll just point out for you because we certainly don't have the time to just sit here and stare at this wall of text is uh, you can, let me think. Hey, let's, let's go in the interface real quick. Let's configure global security. Uh, let's look at the global security palette here and let's enable it just for giggles and a couple of keywords here security realm authorization so let's take a look at what methods we have so I'm gonna search for security realm and right here get security realm you can get your current security realm and start making modifications to it same with authorizations so as you're playing and toying with the script console go ahead and take a look at the context and text that you see on your UI and you can get a pretty good hint of where you need to poke next. So let's, let's uh, get our current security realm, which, uh, which by default is the unsecured Jenkins instance. And we're going to automatically configure this if I ever get this working, because I'm used to different shortcuts. So let's get security realm. If you're a programmer, you typically know that methods are callable with parentheses. So I'm putting that out here just in case you're not a programmer. Um, so let's get security realm and let's append parentheses and click run. 
Yeah. Oops. Thanks. I appreciate it. So here we've gotten our current security realm. Let's go back. I want to go ahead and while I'm looking at my security realm, I want to look at what methods in addition to it. All right, so print, print line. Let's print out the methods in addition. Control C, not Command C. Um, control V dot meta class dot methods star dot name. Get the name of every method. So here we've got our printed out methods at the bottom, we have the return result of our script. Right now, security realm is none. Uh, let's go ahead and configure, configure this real quick, GitHub authentication plugin. Uh, I'm going to configure it with fake stuff because for all intents, we don't care. Uh, and let's save this. And I've just saved my Jenkins instance. And what this did was it took your runtime, it serialized it to XML, and it saved it to disk. And one of the methods that are on here is .save. I'm not going to search for it here, but if you look for it later, there's a method called save. And that effectively does the same thing as clicking the save button. So as you're modifying your runtime, you could do a Jenkins.instance.save and serialize your current runtime to XML on disk. So now that we have just configured our security realm. Let's go ahead and run get security realm again. And now we have the GitHub security realm with an at symbol and some cryptic letters, which in, in Java land, this is called the class instance. This is an instance of the runtime. It's the instance of our configuration. And if we did a Jenkins.save, it would serialize it to XML and save it to disk, which is typically how new configuration management people manage configuration Jenkins is with the XML on disk. Um, so that being said, there's also, for, e for nearly every getter, there is a setter. So there's a set security realm in here. So that means we can create a new class instance of whatever security realm we want, instantiate it, run the setter to set our Jenkins configuration, and then executed Jenkins.save, and we've effectively reconfigured our, our, our uh, security realm on the fly and saved it to disk. So let's play with that. So I typically take the class name, I Google for it to look it up, uh, just so I can look at some constructors. So I'll just say uh, secure, I'll just say this, GitHub, Jenkins, CI, because those are a few keywords that I know will get me there. And here we've got the GitHub OAuth plugin. I'm going to go to the source. I'm going to click SRC main. Follow the path. The path of the class, the package is org Jenkins CI plugins, GitHub security realm. So it should be right up here. And here we have Jenkins security realm. And so let's take a look at the constructor. And while we're doing that, let's take a look at our configured global security page. Here's a couple of things I'd like you to take note here. Here, our web UI offers a couple of configuration op options. Our GitHub URL, our API URL, client ID, client secret, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So let's take a look at the constructors for this class. Yeah, good call. Thank you. So here's a constructor for this class instance. And you'll notice that you've got some variable names here that sort of coincide with the configuration. You've got your GitHub web URI, URL, the API URI, client ID, client secret, scopes. So that means I have all of the same information here that I can set when I create a new instance that will get me, that will basically be the equivalent of click and save in that dialog. So let's create a new instance. Let's just do it on the fly here. Let's let's go to GitHub security. I'm going to say def GitHub. I'm going to create a new instance. I want my URL to be 
HTTPS, of course, because we're always securing. GHE.example.com as my web URI. Uh, let's go ahead and do our GitHub API URI. So for those who have enterprise, it's API slash v3. And let's change this to the classic foo and the classic bar. And our scopes don't don't care. We don't care because we're not really doing real security here. We're just futzing around. So now we're running it. Let's see what we did wrong because I've obviously done something wrong. So what I've done wrong here is I can't resolve the class. I have to import that class now. In the script console, you have access to the entire runtime as well as all plugins and dependencies. So let's go ahead and import our class using the package name here. So, whoop, 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 whoop. Org Jenkins CI copy. So let's import it. And let's also ensure we put the piece that we actually need right here. So we've imported it, we run it again. Huzzah, we created a new instance. Let's go ahead and get rid of this text because we don't care about it. And while we're at it, let's print our existing instance. So here is the incumbent instance, the one that our Jenkins configurations actually look using. And if you have good eyesight, or I can control plus it, and you, you're pretty good at analyzing things, you can see that there's a difference here. The instances are different. So we've got a new object in memory in our runtime, but we're not doing anything with it yet. Uh, if we look at our config.xml, which this is also archaically small, Here we have our existing security realm configuration, which this is also another method that I use to look up class names for the configuration I'm trying to auto-configure, because a lot of times they'll give you the class name right in the config. And let's, let's prove what I said, that you can reinstantiate it, reconfigure it, and then you can save it to disk, but it's all separate, and you kind of have to do it all at once. So if we go to our global security page, we created that new instance, but nothing's changed yet. So now let's use our setter. Let's do Jenkins.instance.setSecurityRealm and set it to our new instance. And set it to our GitHub variable. And let's, let's just run it, see what happens. And if I'm lucky, it won't explode because I'm really bad at this kind of stuff. So right now you see there's no result because uh, a void setters typically don't have a return value, so there's nothing to show. But if we go to our global security page here in the runtime and refresh this page, you'll see that our configuration dialog now has the new settings that we set. It's kind of cool. It's really powerful you can do, that you can do this kind of stuff. Um, and as you start playing with this more, you'll start getting dangerous thoughts in your head and start planning. So another thing I'd like to point out is if you look at the config XML, it's still the same as the old one. What you've done here is you've modified the runtime, but you've not serialized the XML to disk, i.e. you haven't saved your configuration. So anytime you're modifying the configuration and you decide that you need to save, you actually need to tell Jenkins, hey, save. And it doesn't matter where... If, if you're having a hard time figuring out where you need to save, the uh, safe bet is to always call the instances save method. Um, each, each little class and method that for when you're configuring different plugins and stuff like that, they each have their own save method. But I typically call the root save method and just say, hey, save everything to disk. I don't care what else has changed. So let's save it. Uh, actually, I just got rid of something I didn't want. Let's do a new line and save it. So now we're going to create a new instance, and I'm going to just call this haha so that you know we've created a new instance. I'm going to use the setter 
to set my new runtime configuration to my new security realm. And now this time I'm going to save it to disk. So that way if my server dies, my configuration at least persists, persists by the next restart. So let's run it. We did it, I think. No errors. And now let's look at our new configuration in the XML and check it out. Now we have a ha-ha. So this is just a very beginning into what you can do with the script console. Everything in the runtime is an object and the configuration itself that you eventually see on disk. So I'll repeat one more time, the Jenkins runtime is itself its configuration. And when you save that configuration, it serializes it into the XML that you eventually see on disk. So modifying the runtime, therefore, modifies the Jenkins configuration itself. How does this affect um, jobs that are currently running? Like, will they see a change by the end of their run, or will they see new environment variables only after they've completed? So if you're updating a job using this method, which I actually recommend you using other plugins like the job DSL plugin to do that kind of stuff. But if you are updating it during a run, the runtime is its own instance. And so it typically won't take on the new settings during its current run. But the next run, it'll take the new settings. Um, so the thing to remember here is when you're, when you're playing in this is go ahead when you get home or wherever you are, uh, run a Jenkins.instance and look up the methods on the Groovy class. Um, and it will show you a lot of things that you can get into. Not only that, the GitHub OAuth plugin, which I'm the maintainer of, I've also documented how to do this right in our wiki page. So you can always go back here and check it out as, a, as an example and you don't have to go, oh, uh, let me try to copy and paste this or try to transcribe it from a video I'm watching. You can actually go to this plugin page and, and copy and paste for your own play and example. Um, this actually has has came what came to me then is you know how do you integrate this with config management? That's the that's the big thing, right? Config management changes the state of the system, jobs might be running. How do you do it reliably? Some people say use the Jenkins CLI. I say, don't use the Jenkins CLI. Jenkins CLI is itself hooking into the runtime, but it can be buggy. There's zero days occasionally that have been released on it recently, so I actually recommend just disabling it because it's safer to disable it. Um, and, and you can't really get more powerful here than the script console because the script console actually offers you a view into this runtime. Um, so I'm going to show you something else. So, if you Google Jenkins Script Console, I have helpfully added an entry to our to the Jenkins Project's Script Console wiki page on how to actually curl your Groovy scripts that you write for the Script Console right over the web UI, and even how to use authentication with it. So, pretty much all you need is curl. It's not. It it's not. It it's not. It I'll tell you why. <laughs> okay, tell me why. Because if you have properly configured your Jenkins instance with authentication and SSL, you should be the only one who's capable of doing this. Why is that? You remotely exploit your Jenkins software. There, there, Jenkins has its own mechanisms on cross-site request forgery that... Uh, I don't think it is, but you're, if, if you feel it is, I encourage you to open an issue with how you see it being that way and help the project improve. So um, as far as my use cases, as long as you don't give people the capability to do this, which you shouldn't, that little, there's an option in, your, uh, in the configurations that give people access to execute scripts. That gives them the ability to do this. 
So your security then becomes useless. Um, so don't, don't give anyone except admins the ability to execute script console. And if you're using the job DSL plugin, which is one of those things that I mentioned earlier for configuring jobs, don't give anybody the ability to create that either because that also runs on the Jenkins runtime and is just as powerful as the script console. Um, let me think. What else? What else? What else can we do? Uh, we've got ten. We've got five minutes left. Uh, mm -hmm. Very common. My personal opinion is it is. But that's because with this, you get a lot of things out of it. You can actually create what I call myself a Jenkins state machine. That is, in the console, you have a few extra methods in here. Let's, let's uncomment this. And actually, you reminded me what I did want to discuss is there's a couple of extra methods that you can query Jenkins for and say, hey, are there any jobs running right now? Hey, am I in shutdown mode right now? So you can then create item potency with your, with your script console scripts where you could say, okay, I've just updated a configuration that I know needs a restart, so execute and turn on shutdown mode. And then you can have another script in your config management that queries and goes, okay, shutdown mode's enabled, I know I'm supposed to restart, but hold on, let me check if any jobs are running. Oh, there is, I'm not supposed to shut down yet. And just let it run incrementally and go, uh, oh, okay, now we're still in shutdown mode and jobs are no longer running, so let me go ahead and execute a system restart for the, for the service, not, not a OS restart. So it, the script console gives you that kind of power where you can create sort of a state machine to query the system and go, hey, what's running? What's current state? Oh, I see Jenkins is in shutdown mode. I'm not going to try to change anything because Jenkins is in shutdown mode. Someone's trying to change something. I'm not going to try to change the state of the system. So you can get that kind, of, that kind of power out of using the script console for your config management scripts. Whereas the XML, if, you're, if your config management updates the XML, it doesn't reflect in the runtime. You have to do one of two things. You have to restart Jenkins, or there is a helpful or hurtful, depending on how you look at it, a reload config reload configuration from disk, which essentially is the same thing as a restart. It discards its current runtime, reads every XML, XML file on disk, and reinstantiates its environment. Whereas if you're, if you're using the script console to update the environment, you may not need a restart. Like for me, I just reconfigured the, the uh, security realm. That doesn't require a system restart. I just said, oh, okay, update the, update the instance, save the configuration to disk, but don't do anything else. Because if uh, you seem like you've used Jenkins a lot. You, there's a lot of functions in Jenkins that, as you, as you probably know, don't require a system restart when you're saving configurations and doing things. So you, the script console kind of gives you that kind of power to determine, do I need a system restart? Oh, execute one under certain conditions. And so you can handle the, the maintenance of, oh, should I restart or shouldn't I restart off to a robot instead of having a human hang out there and go, okay, let me wait for this job to finish. Let me come back a little later and check to see if it's finished, that kind of stuff. You, you, you no longer need that when you create this kind of state machine. And so I, I, can, I typically configure Jenkins myself 100% through the script console. So that checkbox hell that was described earlier, I don't experience it because my entire Jenkins is configured via the script console in this manner. And so when I bootstrap Jenkins, I download the exact version of Jenkins and all of its plugins and, and then configure it. It is, I'm not going to lie, it's a ton of work. Do you mind if I type in just real yeah. quick? So uh, if you search the Jira issues Jenkins .org for system configuration, Kosuke, so I, I co-maintain the Puppet Jenkins module. Kosuke is trying to address this in, in the world beyond 2.0. Uh, if you have strong opinions about how Jenkins should be configured, look for the system configuration uh, ticket on, on the Jenkins Jira and rant 
at will at Kosuke on, on what should be there. But it's something like there's there's what Sam's proposing or, or talking about, and then there's janky ways with like Puppet or Chef modifying XML that you can do it. But at the end of the day, like Jenkins needs to get better at this, and Kosuke needs that feedback so we can make it better. <laughs> I have a question. So what's your use case? Do you have this recipe like pasted in one of your internal wikis that you then paste into the Console? No. So, so in my personal repos and also uh, in other repos, it's just all tracked in a Git repository, and our bootstrap process involves curling. Oh, okay. Curling the script console with the method that I showed here, where it shows how you can authenticate and curl scripts and, and configure the runtime using the script console. I get it. So, so you have a little way of spinning up server it has the exact same config. Yeah, it's just a bash script. It's a bash script that executes a Gradle command and says download all the right things of the things that I want. And then once it's running, execute these scripts, console scripts in order and run with it. It's very it's when I explain it like that, it sounds extremely simple, but as he pointed out, the work that it takes to get up to that is a lot. Um, it it takes a curious mind. It takes a, someone who's capable of reverse engineering somewhat and, and looking at the source code. And I'm hoping today that I've sort of given you a couple of tips and tricks on how you can possibly do that by looking, by getting instance variables and looking at what class they are and Googling for them or looking at the XML config on disk and see what class is related to that XML configuration so that you can sort of hunt for how to configure that thing. Um, but it's definitely once you get once you sort of get hooked on this way of configuring, it's a rabbit hole, and, it, and sometimes it seems never ending. But uh, the the nice thing about it is by doing it this way, I can now guarantee that my Jenkins instance, no matter if it's in production or on my laptop, bootstraps the exact same way all the time in under a minute. So do you use this method for instantiation, but use APIs for maintaining? Or do you also use the console to maintain? I also use the console to maintain. So my team sort of has this very hard line that we don't touch the web UI. Um, if you're touching the web UI, you're doing it on your local system. Uh, if you need to update plugins on the system, then what you're doing is you're bootstrapping on your local laptop and testing the upgrades and running through integration tests to make sure that none of the plugins you upgraded broke what you currently have running in production. So you don't use the API at all? You, when you say API is in like this API, when you go to nearly any page and you just say a API, like that API? Pretty much, yeah. Um, no, because this API is most commonly used to query information and to, to start builds. Because, yeah, we use it to create jobs. Right. There's, there's, so... I don't use it to create jobs. We use a, I use a job DSL plugin for that kind of stuff, but it's not wrong to do. There's a, there's a lot of ways to skin this cat, and like Unix, there's a thousand different ways that you can achieve what you're doing. So that, that's another way to do it. Um, but hopefully this sort of gets you excited into sort of digging more into the script console because you can start querying your own runtime. You can start troubleshooting. You know, hey, you know, I have to clean up 500 dead agents because someone pushed up a configuration to our slave image that causes the Jenkins runtime to not start correctly. And so when slaves are provisioned, it starts as a dead slave, and now I have 50 slaves. How do I delete them all? Script console is one way you could do it. Uh, and there's tons of examples of how to do that on the Internet. So that's nothing new there. Um, but when I first started getting exposed to the script console scripts, I found the biggest barrier to entry for getting into this kind of stuff was I just simply didn't know where to start. And I'm hoping that this presentation is sort of giving and arming you all with where to start and how you can start digging if you did want to go down this path. So uh, one thing I would also like to add is I talked to Kosuke and Jesse Glick and a few other people when I was at the Jenkins, uh, Jenkins conference, and one of their 
core requirements for their redesign of Jenkins, Jenkins 2.0, or or the web UI redesign that that Gus is putting up, uh, the underlying code, the underlying APIs that makes Jenkins up is not going to change. So I basically got a guarantee from them that my script console scripts will continue to work and auto configure Jenkins even beyond the even if they change how a user gets introduced to it. Because as far as I'm concerned, I don't care about that new user experience. We're fairly advanced users and we auto configure a lot of it and I want to make sure that that doesn't break. And I was promised that that wouldn't happen. So might as well state that. <laughs> so that was pretty much my talk. I think I'm right at the nine o'clock mark. If you have questions, we can keep talking here. I don't have a bedtime tonight, so uh, for anyone who wants to leave and they have a bedtime that they want to meet, you're welcome to leave. If you want to keep chatting, feel free to ask me more. I can't leave. Oh, no. The doors are locked. So, so. Do you use, or your users use Scriptler? I've seen Scriptler, to be honest. I felt like Scriptler was a really high barrier to entry for me to figure out how to use, so I just avoided it. Yeah, you're an admin, right? I'm a sysadmin, yes. Right. So I'm here with my friendly admin counterpart, and we have a friendly rivalry, so I can't do a lot of things. I don't have access to the script console on the on production Jenkins instance. Okay. So I have a salt level host 88. Right. And I tinker around, and I through something works, and I say, hey, this works. And we commit, install the plugin, do this in faith. But I was, I'm kind of pinning some hopes on Scriptler as being kind of a uh, middle ground to, to this. But it may be. I haven't toyed enough with Scriptler to really understand its power and what it's capable of doing. However, Groovy scripts are Groovy scripts. If Scriptler gives you access to modify the runtime or run any kind of admin task, you basically have the script console. And this is one way that you could start writing your scripts from scratch for stuff that no one has written before. Because when I first looked at the Scriptler plugin, one of the main challenges I found with it was it didn't have any tasks that I wanted to do. It had a lot, it had tons of examples that, that uh, other people wrote for their own use cases that they needed to resolve. But I had a lot of my own tasks that I needed to get done. And Scriptler didn't provide any. And for me personally, it was kind of confusing on how to possibly contribute back scripts and how the wiki got updated. So I have eventually just set Scriptler to the side. But I know for a fact that you can use this method to create Scriptler scripts. Uh, so hopefully that gets you closer to creating the Scriptler scripts that you want for your own use cases. Anyone else? Cool. You can follow me on GitHub uh, if you want. There, I'll just post all that info in the meetup because I don't have slides. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I have a lot of interesting Jenkins stuff going on. Like, for instance, if you want to know how to automatically bootstrap stuff, the plugins that I maintain, I have automatically bootstrapped environments for configuring them when I'm testing <laughs> plugins. So go check them out, and you can sort of see how I auto bootstrap the open source plugins and think about how you can make use of them in your own environment. So that's all. Yeah. So I'm assuming these plugins are jars that are written in Java, right?